Warning, everything you're about to see and hear comes from newspaper articles, court transcripts, and interviews with those involved. Thank you for watching. On December the 26th of 1980, Avery Peach's shorts would be sent to the nearby Mini Mart by her mother, who wanted a soda pop. Hazel Smith would give her daughter 58 cents and send her on her way. Roughly two hours after leaving home, Peaches would finally make it to the store. She would enter, buy the soda, exit, and continue on to Joe Lewis Road. In the distance, she would see the railroad tracks and several red apartment buildings. At this point, he would see her. At four foot five inches and 50 pounds, the young girl was a sitting duck. Smoke emerged from the tailpipe of the white Volkswagen as it pulled up close to Peaches. And then it stopped abruptly. He jumped out and he grabbed her. The young girl was slung into the vehicle and it pulled away slowly. Peaches would not be seen alive again. The suspect would never be identified despite an extensive investigation. He beat the system. I guess you'd have to say. <laughs> Avery Shorts was born on May the 18th of 1974 to Hazel Smith and Elwood Shorts. In 1980, Avery would find herself living with her mother in apartment 243 at the Montgomery Village apartment complex in Knoxville. Her father was living in an apartment on Broadway and he hadn't seen his daughter since November. Avery was quiet, shy, and spunky. Her rosy cheeks led to her mother calling her peaches. Many in the apartment complex knew her since she often played with her children. Like many of the younger Montgomery Village residents, peaches frequently wandered the neighborhood unsupervised. By all accounts, Avery Shorts was an ordinary kid. Unfortunately, she was stuck in a dangerous place and she would soon find herself held captive by a monster. The day after Christmas would bring frigid temperatures of 94 degrees to the Queen City of the Mountains. Hazel was cooking in the kitchen when she heard a knock at the door. Peaches would answer it and a 5 foot 7 inch balding man would step through the door. 47 year old Mitchell Arvel Webb and Hazel Smith were acquaintances. I guess that's what you could call them. Webb wanted them to be much more. Hazel, she just wasn't interested in companionship, but she didn't have a problem allowing her suitor to shower her with gifts. On that particular day, Webb would make his move once again. It was the same old, same old. He wanted to move in with Hazel. She would turn him down and ask Webb to fetch her a soda from the nearby Mini Mart. Mitchell Webb would leave behind 58 cents and slam the door on his way out. 
Hazel still wanted that soda, so she turned her attention to her daughter. It was common for Montgomery Village residents to walk to the nearby convenience store, even though there was no sidewalk. The six-year-old could be there in 10 or maybe 15 minutes. The young girl would leave her apartment wearing a pair of blue cotton pants, a blue long sleeve shirt with a snowman on the front, green checked coat, maroon toboggan cap, and blue Mickey Mouse tennis shoes. Her hair would be in ribbons as she stepped out the door. Peaches was not in a hurry. She left home around 3.30 p.m. and hung out with friends before traveling down Joe Lewis Road towards Maryville Pike. When she made it to the intersection, she entered the nearby laundromat and spoke with another young girl. She would stop outside to speak with a man in a white Volkswagen before finally entering the Mini Mart. With soda in tow, she would leave the store at 5 p.m., step outside, and head towards home. In 1980, there was no sidewalk on Joe Lewis Road, so Peaches walked along a dirt pathway. She was nearing the railroad tracks and could easily see the red apartment buildings in the distance. He could see her as well, and he wasn't going to let Peaches slip through his hands. He pulled up to the young girl and jumped out. He quickly opened the back door and grabbed Peaches with both hands. The pop bottle went flying into the nearby woods while Peaches wiggled and kicked. Despite her efforts, she would be thrown into the back seat like a bag of trash and the vehicle would pull away from the scene. Hazel Smith would call police just 48 minutes after Peaches left the Mini Mart. The call was logged at 5.48 p.m. Within hours, the community would be swarming with people searching for the missing girl. Montgomery Village residents would team up with members of the KPD and the Knox County Rescue Squad to search Montgomery Village and the nearby woods. Despite the enormous size of the search, nothing would be discovered. That night, Jim Winston would hear about the disappearance while watching the local news. Boy, this is bad, he would confess. He wasn't wrong, and the case would soon become his problem. As you see, he was a KPD detective, and the case would be assigned to him. He would first turn his attention to the girl's mother. He would ask Hazel about her love life. Did she have any boyfriends? Hazel gave the investigator four names. One would be Avery's father, Elwood Shorts. Detective Winston would also receive the name of Daylily Drive resident, Mitchell Arva Webb, the same man who visited Hazel on the day of the disappearance. With a few names on his list, Jim and others with the KPD would begin searching for evidence. Unfortunately, there would not be much in the way of physical evidence. The only thing of interest recovered would be the pop bottle found along Joe Lewis Road. If Knoxville investigators were going to solve the crime and bring the culprit to justice, they would need to put in the legwork and obtain sufficient evidence from witnesses. There would be many to talk to. Other Montgomery Village residents were unable to offer up any helpful information. So police would turn their attention to the most obvious witness, Clara Coleman, who was working at the Mini Mart when Peaches visited. She saw Peaches in the store and believed that the little girl had left around 5 p.m., just 48 minutes before her mother called authorities. 
The clerk confirmed that Peaches had done just what her mother asked. She had purchased a 16-ounce soda. Another witness was Laura Rebecca Moore. She would meet with investigators on January the 2nd of 1981. She told them that her nine-year-old daughter had been at the laundromat on the day of the disappearance. The little girl let them know that Peaches had entered the laundromat and spoke with her before leaving. When she stepped outside, she saw Peaches speaking with a man in a white Volkswagen. She believed that Avery was inside the laundromat between 4 and 5 p.m. The girl's story would be corroborated by 30-year-old Kathy Church, the woman who drove her there. This led authorities to believe that Peaches had been abducted somewhere between the store and her apartment. They would learn that she was quiet, shy, and spunky. Those who knew her well did not believe she would have gotten into a car with a stranger. Whether good or bad, this would result in authorities placing more emphasis on people Peaches knew. Montgomery Village was and still is not a good place for children. After all, it's one of the roughest neighborhoods in Knoxville, if not Knox County. The low-income apartment complex is operated by Knoxville's Community Development Corp. The area is swarming with drug dealers, gang members, and thieves. In 1980, police would receive reports of 218 burglaries at the 450-unit complex. That was nearly one burglary for every two apartments. Residents complained that their mail would be stolen if they weren't at the mailbox as soon as the mailman left. Bars secured windows on many buildings in the neighborhood and the surrounding wooded area was a common hiding place for criminals and trespassers. Some Montgomery Village residents were hesitant to speak with police and many did not report crimes to authorities. One of the primary suspects would be a resident at the apartment complex. The other would be the girl's father. Investigators would track down Avery's father, Elwood Shorts. At the time of the disappearance, he was living in an apartment on Broadway. His daughter went missing on December the 26th and he had not seen her since November. He was cooperative and agreed to take a polygraph test. After passing that test, he would be ruled out as a suspect. Authorities would then turn their attention to Mitchell Arva Webb, who sometimes referred to himself as Mitchell Reed. He lived in an apartment in the 400 block of Daylily Drive. He visited Hazel and Peaches on the day of the disappearance. Hazel let him buy her gifts. During the summer of 1980, he took her to a Kmart and let her buy whatever she wanted. They would leave the store with two two-piece shorts and top outfits, an avocado green swimsuit, and a camera. Sometime in late August or early September, Webb would come back wanting the items to be returned. This would create a problem for Hazel. She no longer had them. She claimed that some of the clothing had been stolen when she hung it outside on the clothesline. As for the old-fashioned camera, well, she threw it in the garbage. Hazel would later claim that Webb threatened her when she did not return the items. He told me that he was going to get even one day. She asked him, Are you going to get me or one of my kids? Webb would reply, don't worry about it. Hazel would tell the Knox News Sentinel that she is pretty sure she had told police about the threat. 
Investigator in charge, Jim Winston, said that she did not. After the disappearance, Webb would visit Hazel again. This time, police officers would be there. Hazel and her friend would agree that Webb was acting strange, as if he had done something wrong. Webb would return an officer's bat and when he left it behind, then he would leave without incident. Additional incriminating evidence would come from Webb's acquaintance, Jerry Downs. He would come forward and tell police that Webb claimed he had tossed the girl's body off Kate's bridge. After Jerry passed a polygraph test, the Knox County Rescue Squad would drag the river while dogs and helicopters searched the area. But nothing would be found. When questioned by investigators, Webb would admit that he was at the Mini Mart on the day of the disappearance, but he did not see Peaches there. Once he left the store, he drove to Central Street and cruised the area looking for his friend so he could shoot dice. He couldn't find his buddies, so he wound up calling his girlfriend, Mary Elliott, at 5.30 p.m. He would ask her if she needed anything. She said no, and he hung up. He would call back later at 6.10 p.m. By then, Mary had a toothache. She let Webb know about it. He would show up at Mary's apartment in the 1500 block of Daylily Drive with some more gel and Excedrin around 6.50 p.m. It was around this time that he would visit Hazel. Webb would later say that a woman stopped him outside the Mini Mart and asked for a ride. He would refuse. A dog would find Peach's scent in the Cadillac, but that was to be expected. After all, Webb had used the car to take Smith and Peach's places all the time. A local boy would let police know that he had seen Peach's outside the store speaking to a man who looked like Webb with a brown car. The boy would later change his story and police suspected that his parents were to blame. Mitchell Webb was simply not a good man. He was well known by police and was frequently arrested for thefts and burglaries. A year before Peaches disappeared, he would be questioned in the strangling death of 62-year-old Emma Brewer, who was found dead in her Western Avenue apartment. He would not be charged in that crime. Despite it all, investigators had no body and not enough evidence to charge Mitchell Webb. They would interview more than 100 people, but they would keep returning to their primary suspect, Mitchell Arva Webb. The disappearance of Peaches would send shivers down the spines of Knoxville parents. Those in Montgomery Village would be hit particularly hard and some would decide to do something about it. On February the 8th of 1981, Mayor Randy Tyree would encourage Knoxvillians to say a prayer for her safe return. Praying was about the only thing they could do. Residents of Montgomery Village were on edge. They would meet with local authorities to address their concerns. They would complain about the doors to their apartments. They did not close securely, so they could easily be kicked in or jimmied. They asked for peepos to be installed so they'd know who was standing outside their door. Concerned residents also pleaded with authorities to do something about the mailbox situation so their mail would no longer be stolen. Executive Director of Knoxville's Community Development Corp, John Ulmer, would ask Mayor Randy to install a sidewalk from Montgomery Village to the nearby store. That has since been done. Finally, they wanted the nearby wooded area to be cleared. Southern Railway officials would clear the brush a short time later. 
Some were more aggressive about protecting their community. The Crime Prevention Bureau worked with 19 volunteers from Montgomery Village to establish a neighborhood watch program. The volunteers would patrol the property from 7 p.m. until 1 a.m. during the week and until 4 a.m. on the weekend. The patrol was somewhat successful as volunteers once put out a fire and saved two babies in the process. Other residents despised the volunteers and referred to them as the Snitch Patrol. The residents also set up a mother's patrol. Twelve volunteer mamas would agree to watch out for other small children and meet the kids when the school bus arrived in the afternoon. One volunteer, Bessie Howard, wished more mothers would get involved. She would go on to say that she once found a two-year-old wandering around the nearby railroad tracks. Valuables belonging to the residents were marked as a part of Operation Identification to ensure that they could be returned if they were ever stolen and recovered in the future. A Morristown psychic would offer his help, but the information he gave police did very little to help bring Peaches home. Other families of crime victims were not happy with the amount of manpower and resources dedicated to the Peaches case, but that did not change anything. During the investigation, police would receive many tips that they felt were not credible. Others would be ruled out after being investigated. Many of those tips would point away from Mitchell Webb. Faye Ewing would come forward and tell police that she saw Peaches at the Kroger on Taswell Pike. She had met the girl before. She claimed that Peaches was with two African American women. Peaches smiled at her. One of the women noticed and whispered something to the girl, resulting in her putting her head down. After speaking with her husband, Faye decided to tell police about the encounter. Other tips were related to human sacrifices. Police would receive a report of dogs being found with their throats cut in South Knoxville. Some suspected that the dogs were used in some type of religious ceremony. The tip was investigated, but the incidents were not linked to Peach's case. Police would experience some extortion attempts as well. Investigators would sift through the waste at the storage treatment plant on Neyland Drive. Nevertheless, none of these tips provided any insight into Peach's disappearance or her whereabouts. But that was all about the change. With the World's Fair coming to Knoxville in 1982, police had little to celebrate. Their year was about to start off with a ghastly discovery. On January the 23rd of 1982, a father and son were out hunting rabbits in Blount County. They made their way across the University of Tennessee Extension Farm when they discovered something startling. They would stumble across Peach's skull near a dump on the farm off Singleton Station Road in Rockford. A pair of Mickey Mouse shoes would be found nearby near an overturned cattle chute. Police would move the cattle chute and discover the girl's body underneath. The body was decomposed. There was no hair or skin left on the bones. The ribbons were laying there where Avery's head should have been. 
they had been badly faded. Wire was wrapped around the young girl's neck. It would later be discovered that the wire had come from the UT farm. Some plastic was found nearby the body and police theorized that the body might have been transported to the site in a bag. The area where Peaches was discovered was roughly 15 minutes from Montgomery Village and just a mile from the house where Mitchell Webb's parents lived. Lead investigator Jim Winston would say Hazel and an acquaintance often frequented the Rockford area. He would refuse to say who that acquaintance was. Despite searching Rockford several times, investigators had never searched that specific spot. Peaches would be laid to rest several days later in a donated grave at the Sherwood Garden Cemetery. Despite the discovery of the body, the case would begin to cool. Then, a tip would come in and send the case in a whole new direction. That tip would come from one of the most unlikely places, the Morgan County Regional Correctional Facility in Wartburg, Tennessee. In July of 1984, police and the Knox News Sentinel would receive a tip from two inmates. They would claim that another inmate had confessed to killing Avery Shorts. That would lead police to Frank Tate, who frequented Knoxville. He was the perfect suspect as a convicted sex offender serving 10 years for sexual battery of a child under 13. He had been arrested in Knoxville in 1979 for aggravated sexual battery involving a child. When Peaches disappeared, Frank Tate was on parole. More importantly, he apparently knew Peaches and her family. Some Montgomery Village residents remembered seeing him and told police that he was very friendly with children at the apartment complex. Tate had moved to Blount County around the time of Peaches' disappearance. He would tell police that the move was nothing more than a coincidence. When authorities spoke with the two informants, they would change their stories. They would say that they believed Tate did the murder and they wanted something done about it. Those inmates would say that they tried to contact the Morgan County District Attorney's Office, but their calls were not accepted. In the end, police would not focus too much on Frank Tate. Investigators involved were adamant that Mitchell Arville Webb was responsible for the murder of Avery Peaches Shorts. In 1988, KPD Detective Jim Winston would make his move and attempt to bring the suspected murderer to justice. KPD investigator Jim Winston would be removed from the case, but he would not give up fighting for justice for Peaches. In 1988, he suspected that juries would be more accepting of circumstantial evidence. He would request Knox County Attorney General Ed Dossett to begin reviewing the police files to determine if they had enough evidence to take the case to a grand jury. Approximately eight months later, Dossett would make his decision. By this time, Mitchell Arville Webb was locked away at Brushy Mountain Prison for burglary and the Attorney General would turn down the request. He would say, In our opinion, there's not sufficient evidence to warrant prosecution. Sensationalism and speculation are not sufficient to accuse someone of a crime. Charles Coleman was heading the Major Crimes Division at the time. He would say that the Peaches case 
was still an ongoing investigation. It's a case that we would like to solve as we would any unsolved murders. Ultimately, the murder of Avery Peach's shorts would remain unsolved. Even today, nobody knows what happened to the young girl or who was responsible. When speaking to WBR in February of 2019, Jim Winston would continue placing the blame on Mitchell Webb. He would say, We ran down every lead we had. No other abductions, no other molestation of children. It had to be him. He would call Webb a sly con man before suggesting he beat the system. I guess you'd have to say on this case. Mitchell Webb, Frank Tate, nobody would be charged in the case. What really happened to Avery Peach's shorts? The possibilities are endless, yet no one will ever know the truth. Mitchell Arville Webb was painted as the primary suspect. Did he really take his frustration out on Hazel Smith's daughter? He would never take a polygraph test, and police would say that he was the killer. Did police focus too much time and energy on Webb and allow the real culprit to escape justice? The other possible suspect was Frank Tate, the convicted sex offender. He frequented Montgomery Village, knew Peaches and her family, and was a repeat child abuser. It is not far-fetched to believe that Peaches might have fallen prey to this monster. Did Atlanta's child murderer take a trip to Knoxville and return without notice? Was Peaches murdered by someone who had knowledge of the UT Extension Farm in Rockford? Did police foul up the crime by focusing on Mitchell Webb? Sally, this case will most likely never be solved. She would be snatched by a monster, killed, and dumped like a piece of trash. Her killer would go free. It's pertinent to be aware of the dangers your children face. If you do not, they may walk out the door and disappear for good. Have you checked on your children in the past few minutes? Well, you may want to do so right now. <laughs>